Muy buenas tardes, good afternoon, eh, bienvenidos. Welcome to Instituto Cervantes Manchester, a Leeds YouTube channel. We are very glad uh, today uh, to talk about the British in Spain and their life and integration with Professor Karen O'Reilly. Welcome, Karen. Uh, the relationship of the British with Spain is not recent, but can trace back centuries with the interest of many travelers who came to Spain and brought an idealized image of their customs and passions. However, talking about uh, the British and Spain also means talking about the impact of tourism and developmentalism, which has made us one of the leading destinations for tourists and for those who wanted to find another residence outside the United Kingdom and other countries. Walking around some areas of the Costa del Sol or the Valencian coast is like finding, apart from tourists, British people who have been living in Spain uh, for more than 30 years. A community that has generated its own identity in Spain and that faces the future challenges that the Brexit represents from 1st January 2021. Karen O'Reilly is Emeritus Professor of Sociology at Lumborough University. She's a social theorist and immigration specialist who has spent much of her career living amongst and or learning from British people who moved abroad in search of a better way of life. Karen has extensive records and accomplishment of publications in the field, in this field of sociological inquiry. She's author of The British of the Costa del Sol, published in 2000. Lifestyle Migration and Colonial Traces in Malaysia and Panama, published in 2018, as well as numerous other books and articles. She is also part of the Brexit Brits Abroad Research Team, brexitbritsabroad.org, which had examined impacts of Brexit for British citizens living in the European Union countries. It is a great pleasure, Karen, to have you this afternoon and to, to be able to learn a bit more about an issue you have been working on for more than 25 years. Thank you very, very much. So I will uh, put you the first question. Going back to history, in history, the British have always had a special relationship with Spain. According to statistics, uh, statistics sorry, from the National, uh, Spanish National Institute of Statistics, in 2019, there were more than 250,000 Britons in Spain. Why did uh, the British choose Spain and what makes Spain different from other neighboring countries? So, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's, um, I think the best thing that this has done has been um, draw my attention to your institute. So now I can uh, learn more about what you do, which I didn't know about before. So that's a real bonus. Um, I'm looking Thank forward you. to us working together perhaps in the future. That would be really, really good. Um, it's really also nice to have my work recognized in Spain and not just in Britain. <laughs> I mean, it has been to an extent, but not as much as I would like. So I really appreciate that opportunity. It's so, nice. yeah, to go back to your question, um, Pedro, you, you asked about you know, why do the British move to Spain? And it's, uh, it's a huge question. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you for saying, going back in history, the British have been going to Spain for a long time because, you know, you know I, one of the things I want to really draw attention to is that my work has specifically focused on the mass migration to coastal areas from the 70s onwards. So my work doesn't pay so much attention to some of these other migrations of British. And therefore, we mustn't draw conclusions from my work about every British person in, in Spain or in Europe or, or anything. It's, I think there's something 
very special about that particular movement that, as you said in your introduction, is very much linked to mass tourism, um, to development of certain areas, touristy areas. But yeah, first of all, I, I wanted to remember some of the other people who've moved to Spain from Britain, people like Gerald Brennan, who lived in, um, I think he lived in Alarín el Grande, but he lived not far from the Costa del Sol. Uh, Robert Graves, who, who moved to Deia in Mallorca. Yeah. So, you know, we had this really long, and people who fought in the Spanish Civil War and, and moved to Spain. So, so many different types of migrant. But I, I first went in uh, 1993. That was my first time ever going to Spain. Uh, and I was there for 15 months, following fairly typical anthropological methods, the same as you would going somewhere, anywhere in the world to understand the whole community. So living with them, learning with them. My children went to Spanish school. My partner came and he worked, did some odd jobs and things locally. So he got to know people. And then, you know, my goal was to try to understand why all these people, and as you say, so many in the 70s, 80s, 90s moved to these Spanish areas, so many that these places are changed beyond all recognition. Um, and there are new towns, new villages, completely reshaped areas. I mean, I was speaking to sp somebody Spanish recently, and she said, uh, she lives in Malaga, and she said, uh, we're going to the coast this weekend, we're going to Fringalola, then we maybe uh, learn some English <laughs> 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 and have some English food. So that was yeah. just so funny. <laughs> so and I've been thinking about why they go. And I, and I don't like, you know, when a survey or a statistical survey asks why people do something, there's always fairly simplistic answers. But actually, when you speak to the British in Spain, there are so many reasons why they love Spain. And I think you can you can separate them into environmental, cultural and lifestyle. So environmental, it's the weather, the sunshine, the warmth, the the sea, uh, all those things and, and the mountains and the beauty, the scenery, which makes them feel good, makes them feel healthy. They, they say they can have longer days. They can spend more time outside. The, they feel healthier in themselves. So that's one aspect. Then the Spanish culture and whether or not this is, I mean, I think there's a lot that's imagined. Um, I'm not saying it's not real, but there's a lot that's, um, yeah, there's a lot that's, that they conjure up about Spanish people. So they will say things like, but the Spanish love family and the Spanish have respect for their elderly. And the Spanish love children and children are welcome everywhere. And you go in a restaurant and children are welcome. And so the, the British people associate with this as if to say, and this is how we want to be. This is how, you know, I'm older. So therefore I, I'm going to be more expect, accepted or I have children and I feel more comfortable because I can take my children out. So they value these, the, these strong Spanish traits that they imagine are, are strong Spanish traits. Um, I was just trying to think of another one. There was another one just popped in my head, but it's it's gone again. Um, but yeah, definitely sort of oh, a pace of life. Pace of life is absolutely important. Very so important, yeah. The fact that the Spanish value pace of life and quality of life, and this this enables British people to live in that kind of way. And then the third thing, obviously, is lifestyle, because for most people. It costs less to live in Spain, so their money can go further and they can afford to have a better life than they can in the UK. Okay. So that's my main, main reasons for why. Yes, uh, I, I recommend very much the, the, our uh, people who are listening to us. Uh, you are very, very, very interesting book about the Costa del Sol, where you have, to, yeah, uh, uh, special, uh, a very thorough analysis and very, very interesting, and we learned a lot about it. When but we it's talk about now, it's, it's worth me just interrupting you to say I mean, it is, it's already 20 years old, and I think things have changed as well. So, yes, but I read the book uh, recently, yeah, and 
myself, I am Spanish, I learned about uh, my country and the perception from the British of Spain. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's 20 years old, but uh, the, the analysis and the groundwork is, I mean, I, 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 find, it, I find it great and I strongly recommend it to read it because uh, there is a lot of things to, to be learned and to, and to know about it, especially uh, it can be taken for granted the people or the children that are in Spain what they are, but the, the, the analysis and this uh, deep analysis of the mentality is very, very interesting and very, very, uh, uh, very important to 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 understand uh, why the British are in Spain or go to to live in our country. Then we have the question: When we talk about British people in Spain, we have to differentiate between annual tourists and those with partial residence. And then those who lived in uh, all year round. What are the characteristics of British immigrants and what are the challenges? Yes, uh, and thank you again for drawing attention to that because um, this was one of the very first things I learned myself um, way back in 1993, first going to Spain. And um, I just thought I was going to interview British people living in Spain. But of course, actually, it's really quite important to distinguish, first of all, tourists who are in Spain, perhaps for any length of time, but they're there as a tourist. And then there are people who've given up everything in the UK and they live in Spain full time, all year round. And I call those full residents. But of course, there are also quite a lot of people who live in Spain, they maybe have a property or they rent a property in Spain, but come the summer, it's too hot for them. This tends to be more older people. Um, and they, so they go back to the UK. So it's like they've got a second home in the UK and they'll go to the UK to, to escape the very hot Spanish summer. And then there's another category who I guess you would say that their second home was Spain, but their first home was the UK. But every winter, they're escaping the British winter, and then they all go to the coastal areas to enjoy the warmth. And they may rent a property for months and months through the winter. So there's a, a sense of where is home. I think we sometimes have to, when we want to say, why don't these British people settle or why don't they learn the language or whatever? I think we have to understand them a little bit in their lifestyles. It's not, and it's the same actually for many Swedish people, many German people, uh, other nationalities. It might not be their first home, but it's a, a home of sorts. And then there are also people who now, this is even easier, apart from now with COVID, but before COVID, <laughs> to go backwards and forwards and have both as home. So a few weeks here, a few weeks there, especially if you can work online. Uh, and then you asked what their challenges are. And I think their challenges are, um, I think we have to understand their attitudes to home and where home is, and this helps us understand how they might settle and how they might not. But I, I also want to say that, of course, there are all other types of people in terms of there are people who are retired. We know there are many retired, but we get this stereotype of British people in Spain as if they're all retired and they're not. Yeah, so many retired, that's scary, true. That There are many retired, but also working. There are many retired who are also quite young. There are many families. I mean, you must know you have some schools that have more British children in than Spanish children. <laughs> so um, there, there are masses of children. There are people who are entrepreneurial type running their own business. Uh, there are used to be anyway, people working in timeshare, young people working in timeshare, not so much now. So their challenges are, like anyone else, their challenges are related to their stage of life. So, you know, if, if they're thinking about securing a future, having enough money to live off, having enough money to be able to settle and stay somewhere a long time, um, settling the children in school and thinking about their futures and where they might live in the, in the future. Um, so, yeah, their challenges are, are 
pretty much the same as anyone would have, but also associated with living in a, in a new country with a new language and learning the new rules, learning the bureaucracy in a, in a new country. Yeah, I, I, I read the, the bureaucracy is uh, sometimes <laughs> a difficult point for the British. <laughs> in the Absolutely. Uh, the Spanish way of life is often mentioned, uh, an image of some beaches, parties have been reproduced in some sub, uh, operas set in Spain. Do the British have an idealized image of Spain? And uh, what is the perception of Spain from, from the United Kingdom, from the British here in the United Kingdom? Ah, uh, that's interesting. So um, when I first decided to go to, to Spain to do this project, I'd, I'd finished my degree and I wanted a project so I could do my, my doctorate. And there were two television programs. One was called Paradise Found and the other one was called Paradise Lost. <laughs> and they, they, portray, they portrayed the British in the, the beach areas, in the coastal areas, as if, and they were almost all in bars, running bars and restaurants. This is why we have this image that everyone is either retired or running a bar or restaurant. Um, so, so, but they portrayed them as, oh, they've gone to follow this wonderful dream of living in the sun and having a leisured life, but look how awful it actually is. They're working hard, it's very hot and sweaty, and they don't get chance to go outside. But I knew, because my partner had been on holiday to Spain and lots of people I knew had said, oh, they have such a wonderful life. So I thought, this is very strange that we have this these images and it's constantly been interesting the way that the British people portray the British in Spain. So we still have this idea that they're all retired and just drinking a lot of alcohol and <laughs> sitting around with, with Union Jack t-shirts on <laughs> all the time. Um, so I think it's interesting because that, that's the view we have of the British in Spain, but the view that the British have of Spain, also you've got to think where the idea comes from. And um, I mean, you probably better to tell me, is it is it idealised? But I think we have to realise that the, the, the movement I'm talking about is a movement linked to mass tourism. So in the 1960s, as you know, Spain absolutely became the center for mass package tourism, especially for British people. So the way that British people knew Spain was either through our mass media or through tourism. Um, and the way, so the place was marketed for British people as sun, sea, leisure, pleasure, fun. It wasn't marketed until much later years. And I think the Spanish Tourist Board has some role to play in this. Yes, yes, of course. The Spanish Tourist Board also realised that maybe they could um, promote Spain in slightly different ways and not just sun and tourism. Um, and now you do have a little bit more of a, an image of Spain as, you know, a 21st century country, dynamic and with rural areas and with a good respect for the environment and other things. But I think we do have to understand British movement to the coastal areas as often being inspired by this idea of a holiday. I do want to, um, at this point, just mention a couple of people, a couple of British people who are trying to change things a little bit. So one is Patrick Meehan, and he is currently writing. So he's a British man living in, in uh, Fringarola, and he is currently writing in English the history of Fringarola. The history of? History of Fringarola. Oh, okay. Um, so he's done the research, he's putting it all together because... Oh, very nice. It's so frustrating to, for British people to find more information about where they live. It, it, the, the Spanish have not been good at celebrating their history and culture uh, for different audiences, I, I think. So Patrick, Patrick is doing that for us. 
Patrick is doing that f for you, which is a bit colonial, I know. But he, he <laughs> no, no, I, I didn't say that uh, in a uh, you know sarcastic way. Uh, no, in this, I, I, I is we have to thank the the uh, Britain or the the foreigners that come to to Spain or to other countries, and they take so such an interest that they come to 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 study and to promote to the real history or the reality of this country so in that in that sense i, I think it's something very valuable that we have to thank for that um, i mean he he's read about the history himself in spanish and he's excited to share it with other people who don't have that level of spanish and wants to share wants to share it so and then the other person i wanted to mention is jenny rhodes she writes for the uh Sur in english um, as well as a, another newspaper at the moment, I've forgotten the name. And she's been doing a little, some visiting all the, uh, all the little villages and writing for the English readership, writing about their festivals, their history, a little bit about their environment. So I think it's really, I think it's really great. And, and, you know, there is this danger to focus on just some types of British people abroad. And it's very, very diverse. No, of course, that would be maybe an idea to invite uh, uh, Patrick and the, this lady to to uh, to speak about their work in the future and see. Those I, I would also. enjoy that. I will give you the yes. idea to recognize the, 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 what they are doing, the great work they are doing at the moment. Uh, in the introduction to your book, uh, "The British on the Costa del Sol," you talk about your own personal experience, fears, and apprehensions when you decided to move to Spain. It's an experience that many people will relate it to. What are the difficulties faced by the British immigrated to Spain? And what is the integration process like? Well, I think I have to acknowledge that I have contributed myself to a stereotype because I have been, I have said that the British don't integrate on a, on a general level they don't integrate. Um, and that has been quoted from me se several times. Um, I've, ha I've had to rethink that over the years because I think it depends what we mean by integration and, and what we expect. This is very, very, a very ample term. I'm very, yeah, subject to many interpretations, of course. Exactly. But you are a sociologist, uh, maybe you can tell us. <laughs> Well, yeah. So I think if, if we just took it as learning the language and getting to know Spanish people, then it, you know, as you know, you go to the coastal areas, you can meet people who've lived there 30 years and they still don't speak much Spanish. Um, and I have to say, there are obviously there are people who are absolutely fluent and there are people who've most of them have tried to learn. Mo the majority have tried to learn, the majority will learn a few words, but then a lot of them will eventually just give up. And I think it's because they're in a mass tourist area where people are often speaking back to them in English, um, practicing their English, getting excited that they want to practice their English, which is great. <laughs> the, 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 the English person can't manage to, to practice their Spanish. They do get to know their neighbours a little bit, but it's it's fairly superficial, uh, mo mostly in the, in the general level. But you, I think we have to remember that, um, generally speaking, they're not when we're talking about people working, they're working in the tourist industry, or they're working as uh, self-employed or of their own account, or they're working in industries that serve other tourists, be they German, Swedish, British, whatever. But oh, the, yes. as, yeah, as you know, the language they're most likely to use is English. So I just think it, it, it is difficult to learn the language beyond saying just a little bit. But then I've been, I've been thinking about that more recently. And, and I, I think about where I live here. I know my neighbours, but I don't speak to them very much. <laughs> um, not all the time, maybe. Yeah, it's friends, but but it's not something that we will do everywhere with, with it, every neighbor. Yeah. And, you know, I go to my local shops, but my friends are here, 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 here. And, we, and now at the moment we communicate by Zoom <laughs> or, or, or whatever, or telephone. So I think 
if you ask if the British people have settled and made a home, um, then yes, they have settled and made a home. You know, there, there are people, as you say, 30 plus years, and this is where they have their friends, they have their memories. I think it's really important. If you've been somewhere long enough and you've got memories, maybe you've had births, deaths, marriages, illnesses, to, and th this is where you've had those things. This is where y your heart is. Oh, and I, the best way to, to explain that is when you have older people, and, and I know quite a few people who've been there so long that they're reaching their 80s or or even 90s. And then when a partner dies and then the family says, maybe you should come home. And these people say, but I am at home. Yeah, this that is, is the point. Yeah. yeah, you know, this is home. And it's home because it's where they feel at home. It's where they've put their roots down. They have some friends, they know some Spanish people, they know how to go to the market and buy the things they want. They know how to cook a paella, they know how to make a, a Spanish tortilla, they know where to go and get the, the nice, you know, the, the, right, the right kind of brandy that they want to drink. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, they, they have their life there. Exactly. Exactly. So I think, um, I think, yeah, they have integrated. It, it can be challenging. The bureaucracy, absolutely, is probably the biggest issue. <laughs> bureaucracy everywhere is complicated. <laughs> it's complicated and it's not very good not speaking good Spanish. Yeah, in, that's a in, yeah. yeah. So, it, yeah, it's, bureaucracy is complicated. And maybe it's possible that when some people thought they could just go and live in Spain, they wouldn't have to deal with, with things like that so much. Uh -huh. And it comes as a bit of a shock, shock perhaps. Um, OK. Uh, then pubs, beaches, leisure is common perception of both tourism and British residents in Spain. However, there is no mention of groups of and associations that help expats integrate within different areas. Can you tell us about some projects of integration of British communities in Spain? I mean, there are so many organizations, perhaps not so many as there were when I wrote the book in 2000, but there were so many I always remember this same story that there was somebody fairly new who came to to the Costa del Sol and she was a singer she liked to sing in a choir and uh, she was asking people is there a is there a choir group and somebody said well no but so you should set one up <laughs> <laughs> that's a good idea <laughs> This is the attitude that, like, if something doesn't exist, try to find it, try to join it in Spanish. But if it Let's doesn't start it, yeah, just that, just start one. So there are there are groups for for so many things. But I again, I do want to draw attention to some things, and you you might want some to interview some of these people as well. So Ali Meehan, this is Patrick's partner, Ali Meehan. She, I don't know if you know her. She's the founder of Costa Women. Costa Women has it's a it's a social network for business women. It's it's, a, it's for women. I don't know what the what language they use, but they mean foreign women. So women coming to Spain. Well, all over, not only British women. Not only British, exactly. She they have one hundred and thirty seven nationalities. Okay. Many of these women are are fluent in Spanish because they're business. They do business there. So she's got 9,500 members. Oh. 9,000, yeah. In so, Malaga, in Malaga, whereabouts? She lives in Fringalola. I'm not very good at pronouncing that name, but that word, but she lives in Fringalola. Fringalola, it's perfect, yeah. no problem. Fringalola, <laughs> I'll try. Yeah, she lives there. I can give you her details <laughs> or you can look her up. So that's one I just wanted to tell you about. Joan Hunt. Do you know about Joan Hunt? No. So Joan Hunt in the early 1990s, I think she's very old now in her 90s herself, with a Spanish lawyer and a Spanish doctor, 
they set up the Cancer Care Foundation. And oh, yes, I, I, I read in the book, yeah, a very, very nice history. How she, with fighting many uh, 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 sometimes setbacks and difficulties, but at the end, they, they, they were successful on building this uh, hospice for the, uh, for hospice. the, for the and people. They, and they have charity shops all over the area. So charity shops and, and hospice and amazing achievement. And she's such a lovely lady. Amazing. So I'm very lucky because I knew her when I did my first research in the early 90s. We met then. And one of my first things I did was to do some volunteering for them. So, And then there's Charles Betty. Charles Betty was awarded the MBE last year for services to the British community abroad. Oh, yeah. uh, 96 years old. Oh, my God. But his doctorate about why do British people return from Spain? Okay. And he has set up um, an interpreter, interpreter system across the coast, across the Costa del Sol. So he started in just one hospital, helped get some interpreters, some volunteer interpreters. And then it spread to, to the whole Costa del Sol. Spread. Very mm -hmm. nice. And then one other person I want to tell you about is Joan Fallon. And Joan Fallon has interviewed Spanish women about um, his, Spanish history and how and social change and how life for women, Spanish women, has changed. The evolution of our society regarding women. Right. The evolution of your society through the perspective of women. So this is called Daughters of Spain. So um, I get very excited because I, I think that's... We can, we can uh, uh, notice that this is very evident. Uh, <laughs> and that makes the whole dialogue more interesting and more passionate. Yeah, thank you. Um, migrants also have their moments of loneliness and misunderstanding, which in many cases generate a desire to return. Is there a desire to return to, to the UK or would it be easier to reintegrate back in the, for the British who decide to come back? This is definitely a question you should ask Charles Betty because <laughs> that, that's what his PhD yeah, that's about, what he is. is about returning. I um, study about it, yeah. Yeah, and I know I know less about this because I've always focused on the people there. And the funny thing is, when they come back, it's actually quite hard to find them um, because they come back and they live in all sorts of different places. But I but I think it's still the same now that if you ask British people in Spain, "Do you ever want to go home?" they just say no. I never want to go home. And one of the first things that struck me. And this is interesting because I work in the field of migration studies more broadly. In migration studies more broadly, there's always an assumption that you kind of didn't really want to leave your home country. And at one point you will go back or at least when you die. British people say, I never want to go back even when I die. I want my ashes here. I want to be buried here, or or something. So. Yeah, actually, I, 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 uh, that is something that I did knew also. Uh, the cemetery, British cemetery in the Costa del Sol, is very old. It's you not know, something old. from the sixties. It's hundred years old or more. Yes. So that is related to your answer that the people tend to, some of them tend to want to 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 be buried there because they consider it is their it's homeland. Happy. It's home. Yeah, it's very interesting. But of course, they, they do go home. I came home. <laughs> you know, I mean, we, we tried to live there 50%. Yeah, in between. Yeah, with the mobility um, nowadays. I, yeah. I came home because I couldn't follow my career there. Um, my children were, were growing up. And, and so, you know, children get to reach their A-level or university. Yeah. They might choose to come back to the UK. People do sometimes get older and they decide, but I think mostly reluctantly decide that for their long-term care, uh, they want to be back with family. The family uh, here, yeah, maybe. I think, you know, for things like long-term care, 
people do also go back. The financial crisis was a problem, of course, for people because some businesses were suddenly not viable. There weren't so yeah. many tourists. Um, and so businesses became less viable. So those mm. people came home. Um, and some will come home for opportunities that they, they have at home. And I say back, not home. I would be told off for calling it coming home. <laughs> they, would, <laughs> they would say, I'm not going home, I'm going back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, British people in Spain as a collective had generated their own identity and their collective representation. What are the characteristics of how is it interpreted from the United Kingdom? The other world, in other words, how are the British living abroad seen? Yeah, I mean, we did talk about this a little bit earlier, didn't we? But um, we've, this is something that still frustrates. Yeah, but the question is how they are seen from here, from from the, 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 how are the British living abroad seen from not only that, but also in Britain? Yeah. So how do the British see the British? Yeah. In, yeah. So, um, as I say, this is still something that frustrates me because we, as, as you know, we've been working on how Brexit affects British people living across Europe. Every time we publish something in a newspaper or in a um, like a report for we, we've published in some journals that are, are kind of a popular readership, not a newspaper, but wider readership. Mm. We have to say, please, when you find images, don't just go for the same stock images because they keep pulling out these same images of old people in the sun the stereotypes <laughs> it's such there are such stereotypes of course there are old people living in the sun and they're having a very lovely life yes, but it, it excludes so many other people and it also serves to kind of draw a conclusion that they're not anybody we need to worry about or think about because they're just all old and retired and, and well off or if they're in france they're or middle class and they've got plenty of money and we don't have to worry about them. Um, so it's a kind of dismissiveness as well. And in our um, project, our Brexit project, one of the things we've done is analyzed, ha analyzed Hansard. Hansard is like the ongoing record of parliamentary debates. And we wanted to see how British in Europe are spoken about. And when we looked closely, we were quite shocked that they, most parliamentarians, most MPs seem to think that they're, they're across Europe. They have ignored the fact that actually 80% of British in Europe are working. They still constantly talk about them as expatriates. So one thing we've done is drawn attention to the, our concerns about the use of this word. I'm pleased you've said migrants not expatriates because expatriates is a very value-laden term actually associated with companies taking somebody abroad That's a different work. concept it is a different concept so they talk about them as expatriates and they always kind of or majority of the time assume that they're middle class or old um, have no sense of how many of them there are and we i don't know if you know also we have a kind of a tradition of portraying the British abroad as a bit flippant, a bit um, not serious, but also as criminals. So there's this tradition as well, because I, I, we didn't have an extradition treaty with Spain until the mid 1980s, I think it was. So many of the earlier um, stories of British abroad were about criminals escaping and going to live in in fact, I have actually met some of these people. <laughs> and you, and so you, you didn't met those people and you have research and you have been living in Spain. There might be this, not so many, so, so the saturation of the media or just exactly. stereotypes. Now, again, it's your romantic idea. You have people who got rich and then get away. No, but this is not the reality. Exactly. I mean, the trouble with stereotypes is they're based on a little teeny bit of reality. So, of course, of course, they do exist, but they're not the whole picture. They're a tiny, that's, that's, that's tiny right. yeah. picture. 
So yes, we do still have very very stereotypical images. Yes. Of this is the reason why it's so important that the work that you have done with this research because we can uh, know and learn about what is the actual reality and not stereotypes or romantic ideas which are which could be very nice for the literature, but the reality and to understand each other or to improve the situation of the people is not the best way. Uh, an issue that affects the Britain in, in Spain is an important way is Brexit. A new framework of coexistence that must be faced. Impact does Brexit have on residency in Europe? What is the impact that the Brexit would have? you might ask this question, it's not an easy one. Yeah, I mean, th th this would take a long time to answer this question, but um, I, th I think a short answer has been, it, it's been very, very difficult. It's been a frustrating and challenging and difficult time. If you imagine people who do have the resources of, of whether that be the right kind of contacts, the right kind of knowledge, the right enough money to find out, to get their papers in order, it's even difficult for them. I mean, I've spoken to some very wealthy people who are still having to make decisions. Well, you know, is this all going to go wrong? And my mother's getting older and maybe I should make a decision now and go home and... So imagine if, it, if it's been difficult for people with lots of resources, then the people who have really suffered through this last three to four years has been anybody living on close to the breadline, you know, because there are, there are people who they, they, they came to Spain because they didn't have very much money, but they could have a much better life with that little bit of money in Spain. And then it's like, can I afford to stay? Can I afford to get my papers in order? Will I need to pay for my health insurance? Will I need to do something for, for my pension? So people like that, anybody with a long-term illness, anybody with any disabilities, younger people who've got to think about careers and jobs and where they might live in the future, whether they might go and study somewhere else in Europe, it's been difficult for for all those groups. And I have to say that um, some of those early interviews that we did with people, my friend Michaela Benson and I, we would often be on the phone to each other afterwards and say, well, it, I, we just want to cry because you're listening to people tell you their stories and it's so challenging. It's, and people still aren't really clear what the situation is. I mean, yes, okay. I mean, I have to say the Spanish government has been as supportive as any. I mean, very and very early on came out and said, well, we're going to let everybody stay and we'll help you. And that was very reassuring. But still, when it comes to the local authority and the local interpretation of that and people telling you exactly what papers you need for what, nothing but confusion across the whole yes. of Europe. At one point that I uh, was very, uh, I, I, as a Spaniard, very happy to read about is that you feel very welcome in Spain all the time. Yes. That's uh, the, uh, from the very beginning, uh, and that was one of the reasons the people to move to, to Spain was one, uh, at this point, the, 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 the path of life and to feel welcome, not only from the, from the Britons of the community, but also from the Spanish even with the language barriers sometimes. It's true. And I think sometimes the language barrier has has something to do with it because the Spanish are so willing to, to go into English and help you out. <laughs> and that's why you end, you end up talking in English. But um, yeah, one of the first things that people were saying to me about Brexit was that their neighbours had come up to them in the street and said, uh, uh, we want you to stay. Yeah. We're happy that you're here and that, you know, many stories like that, that, that people, Spanish people they knew had put themselves out to say, but, but we are happy to have you and we like having you. Very good. Uh, you have also worked with, on researching uh, the Britain's community in very different countries and realities. 
Could we say that this, is there a similar pattern in all those communities abroad, uh, British communities, that you have analyzed or studied? So we've looked across Europe um, and also I did some research in Malaysia and Hong Kong. So they're mostly where I focused. And I think if you look across Europe, then you can see that the imagination of a place absolutely affects the kind of life you think you're going to have there. So, you know, you, you don't go to Berlin expecting to have a tourist way of life. You go to Berlin expecting to have a very vibrant, young, creative life. Um, you go to rural France expecting to have a, a rural type of life. So it, for me, it's very interesting how places... The, the, the public image of each place, yeah. That places come to have meanings and people move. We, we've written actually a book about this. Um, I think it's theorizing lifestyle migration. And I have a chapter in there about what's called social imaginaries. And I love this term, social imaginaries. Social imaginaries, that it's is the right how, term, yeah. It how a they, lot how people imagine that, that, that their life in another country, in another city. and exa Exactly, yeah. And, and sometimes course, they, they get so eager that they want to go. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, I think, what they ex how they expect to live and therefore how they act a little bit when they get there. So, you know, you, you go to France and you think, I'll open a gîte, I'll run a gîte, I'll have some visitors staying in my gîte. You go to London, you expect to have a, a job in the city. You know, it, it yeah. affects how you, how you expect to live. Somewhere. Expectations, yeah, very important. Uh, can you, uh, we go to, uh, near to the end of the, this very wonderful uh, uh, um, talking and interview. Can you tell about the project that you are working on? So do you mean the Brexit project or my... No, the project, academic projects, because I mean, you're a sociologist and you have research from different topics within migrant communities in different countries. At this moment, what are your projects? Are you working on a new book or what are you doing at the moment? Well, um, we just published an edited volume on something very different. So this is called International Labour Migration to Europe's Rural Regions. It's a horrible title, <laughs> but it's about... In which, um, in, which, in which time this migration, in which period? Historic, or, uh, it's, it's recent. It's, so it's a collection of studies of um, labour migrants working in the fields, working in the farms. So in there, not it's not my research because it's a collection, but in there we have some studies of people working in Spain as shepherds, <laughs> a shepherd looking after, yeah. And we have studies of people picking fruit in Spain and in Italy. Uh, so we're, we're looking at lab labor migration and how labor migrants are treated in rural areas. On how it affects the, the cultural dialogue and all the implications. Uh, that they not have so to much, it. no, this is more of a focus on, labor, on yes. how their experiences are as migrants in these, these areas. Very, very interesting. Uh, I am uh, very pleased the interview was, was great. And it reinforced me also how important it is to study the immigration. It was, it had been for, centuries a reality of our societies are even more important and then it is even more important to to have the professor the the, uh, the academics who take care and the time to analyze it and to to help us to understand each other that is the would be the 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 message and the the results thank you very much it was very interesting and we can learn a lot and uh, i mean uh, we are very pleased to recognize your work and uh, what we have learned about uh, our country, about Spain. And I hope to have you in the future with these projects and the and these uh, people that hope you have also mentioned that they are working about the history for Kirola or the other communities. So uh, thank you very much, Karen, to have you today you. here. It was a real honor and pleasure for us. Thank you. It was all my pleasure. Thank you.